Everybody. Welcome to episode 495 of Floor Wrestling Radio Live. I'm your host, Christian Piles, joined once again by the trifecta, our version of Rodman, Pippin, and MJ. I won't say who's who. We'll go uh Who go are Roper. you? Are you Phil ja- Are you Phil Jackson? Uh no, I'm Jerry Krause. <laughs> oh, brutal. <laughs> Steven Kyle Bracky, oh, Lee man. Roper, coach of you and I, and Ben Askren on the line here. Man, we had a, had a lot of fun on the last show. I'm really, I'm really excited to do the show. How, how are you doing this morning, Coach? Good. I can't hear Lee, uh, Tyler. Uh-oh. Is he talking? He did speak. Can, uh, there he is. I can't. Anybody got doing, me? Coach? Yeah, I got hey, you. Hey, we got you. With the trifecta, Bradkey's got to be Jordan. I've seen him dunk. He's, I know Ben and I don't have those hops. That's I'm t- true. I'm telling you, we we got to put we got to re-release the uh, send Tyler the crazy dunk you did. Uh, but the, yeah, yeah, we'll send him that just so you get a sense. If we're gonna talk about the last dance and Michael Jordan, we've got to show Flow Sports is Michael Jordan, Kyle Bracky. You're right. Um, so he's MJ. I feel like Ben has to be Rodman in this scenario. <laughs> he has to be. Oh my God. <laughs> the Rod, but the only Rod. The it's interesting because. Ben never drank, and Rodman only drinks. Yet, right. can, can Rodman do, does it all, baby. He does it all. Oh my word, does he ever? That guy that is an interesting, interesting character. So, um, Ben, you put something in here at the top. Do you want to start with that, or do you want to go into? I, I got, a, I got a couple things. You know what? I think I'm feeling a need for connection, Christian. I oh, show, wow. I, you know, well, you know, we can't leave the house. I'm, well, you know, I'm stuck here. So first, I I just sent you guys, uh, it's on the doc, and I sent you via text. Did you guys see this bum fight on Twitter? (laughs) I did. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I saw you tweet about that. A bum fight. uh, Guys, I watched it so many times, I didn't tweet twice about it. It is so (laughs) fantastic. It's so fantastic. You got to watch it. Just (laughs) wait. Wait for the kicks. (laughs) This looks like street beefs from, uh, I don't know if you, if you yeah, y'all listen to the shows. We talk about street beefs. This is pretty good. Oh, man. He hit him with the Muay Thai. All right, we got to send. It gets better. We, we got to get it this to Tyler. Better. Hold on. All right, we got a lot of things. We got to send this to yeah. Tyler. Put it in the queue. Oh, I forgot. We can put it on the on the show. Yeah, we have we have the oh. power. All right. Okay, while Tyler's getting that ready, Christian, that, that is a great call. <laughs> the way this guy lines up this kick, dude, I must have watched it 20 times. And I just was laughing harder and harder every single time <laughs> he pulls the first one back and then relines it up. Oh, my God. Um, we're talking about bad wrestling movies, and I thought about one that I coached this kid in camp, and he was actually a state champ in New Jersey as a sophomore. He was really good. And somehow they recruited him to do this movie called Win Win with Paul Giamatti, who's actually a, you know a pretty big movie star. And then he quit wrestling. He didn't even wrestle as a junior and senior. And, you know, I don't know where he's at now, but he pursued – I guess he was going to pursue an acting career or go to college or, you know, something like that. Yeah. I forgot Did you guys movie. watch that? I watched that movie. You, I actually yeah. – I didn't think it was terrible, actually. I thought it was I thought it was pretty good. Okay. It wasn't like super rest- – it was like wrestling was a part of it, but it wasn't – He. I remember his best move was a Peterson, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. He's hitting Peterson yeah, like was, crazy. He, he was a legit wrestler. Yeah, no, I remember – I remember he, there's an interview of Flo uh, with him after he won Jersey State. And he kind of talks about his his future a little bit. Um, yeah, he was tough. Mm. So yeah, I've I've seen that one. You should watch it. I think uh, there's a couple. Of, I think Jeffrey Tambor's in that one too. The guy from Arrested Development. Anyway, um, mm. yeah, that's a good that's a good movie as well. If you like. Sorry to distract. No, no distractions. That's fine. I'm looking at the VMix, Christian. Do we have Bracky Dunk queued up? Is that what? Is that what we're? Well, yeah, watch? but I wanted the bum fight first. I thought that would be better, <laughs> but I don't see it, so I don't know. I'm just, I'm just waiting to see it in the queue, and then we can talk about it. But until then, um, do you want to well, get? Well, into- I, well, I, Go ahead. One more thing. Right. I am, I'm told, I'm taking you way off crack. You know what? One bracket that's been discussed a lot is a 2849 bracket, which I know is probably, I would agree, one of the greatest of all time. Uh-huh. Well, we were talking about Gregory Gillespie versus um, Jesse Jans yesterday, and I started digging in. I put this link in the in the in the doc. I started digging into this 149 2007 bracket, so the year before, mm-hmm. dude. There was some awesome matchups in this bracket. I mean, 
Burroughs, Schlater, round one. How did I forget that? And then Burroughs well, goes to the WrestleMac, and he gets the number two match. Burroughs lost the number one and number two guys in the well, first three I, rounds. I'll say that it was why you don't remember it is because at the time, Jordan Burroughs was not Jordan Burroughs. He was a 15 and 11 freshman who was unseated. Sure. So it's like, you know, the magnitude of it. Um, it really kind of speaks to the, the jump in levels he made from 2007 to 2008. But uh, here we go. I, I, ben, <laughs> oh, please give us some uh, expert analysis of this uh, of this battle here. Go ahead and play it, Tyler. Oh my God, it's so uh, great. All right, what, what do we got going on here? Do we know what city well, is know, taking place? Uh, someone posted what city it was, but I can't recall what it is right now. Is Tall guy, the only size him up. <laughs> I don't believe so. Gigantic reach advantage on this guy. I know the guy yeah. the, with the shirt. Dang. Oh, look at those John kicks. Jones. He, oh, he's, he's got some taekwondo oh. back up, spinning back kick. <laughs> Dude, Boom. But he's then, got some real he moves. Put, he puts him out of his car. He put, oh, wasn't going to be good enough. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, oh, oh he blasted him. Oh, oh my God. He's gone. That's it. That dude was trained. <laughs> that dude was trained. Oh, man. That wasn't right. How about he pulls back the first kick? I couldn't stop laughing at him pulling it back. Oh my word. Ben, the uh, one that made me laugh is the look on the guy's face after the spinning back kick. He's like, "Whoa, I didn't sign up for this." Like, hold on, no, I'm not. Like, nope, yeah. I'm not. I did not sign up for this. Oh my gosh, yeah. You gotta be careful who you pick fights with. You never know who's a classically trained in Rex Kwon Do. Um, all right, so now we've got the we've got the dunk oh, while we're to to. to uh, how how many times did it take you to do this? This Rocky? one took a while because I kept. There's a pipe on the wall uh, there behind the hoop, and I kept hitting the pipe, and then the ball would go a crazy direction. Oh! So he goes behind wow. the back. Look at look at the hype man, Nomad. Just ready. He's <laughs> Nomad was pumped. Our, uh, our, yeah, our attorney, Paul, he was really fired up, too. Yeah, he was super <laughs> impressed. Behind the back, between the legs. That's artistry. That's poetry and motion. And, yeah, that, wow. Yeah. Smooth, Randy's no bobble. Jordan. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. He's smooth. He's smooth. So yeah, that's just that the, was... that's just a taste of the Kyle Bracky athleticism. What wow. you really need on tape is Kyle Bracky when he loses at something. <laughs> that is <laughs> that is worth that is worth filming, um, for sure. Okie doke. We'll talk about temperamental Kyle Bracky some other time. Well, let's get to the last dance. I. I I think there's a lot of parallels with wrestling in this that we can make. I think it's worthwhile just discussing as just the piece for what it is. Um, ben, we you had the homework of, of getting caught up as best you can. Why don't you why don't you oh. give us some of your your thoughts on the Last Dance, the Michael Jordan documentary? Oh, it's it's awesome. Uh, I love it. I was a big Jordan fan. I read a bunch of books about him. I mean, I've tried to read about any elite competitor in any field. And obviously, he's about as elite as it gets in his field, uh, you know. So, I loved it, man. He was so candid. They got to ask so many really good questions. You got, uh, you know, his take on so many different aspects of his life from the gambling. It, it, it felt like people were just reaching for something that they wanted to crap on Michael about because he was, I don't want to say squeaky clean, but pretty close to squeaky clean. Um and yeah, just the whole dynamic of the team and the and and all the other players in the league they got to interview, it was just awesome. Yeah, but, well, it's interesting. The the gambling is an interesting thing because, on the one hand, yeah, he's just he's a super rich dude with hundreds of millions of dollars. He can do what he wants with his money. But on the other side of the coin, he was out till four in the morning the night before the oh, Eastern Conference. Oh, stop, fight. Christian! Stop what? What do you mean stop? What do you they do the night before your fights, Ben? They don't play the game till 7 p.m. You don't think being up all night, that doesn't disrupt your – come on, Ben. You know anything? Yeah, Mr. Listen, you read everything. That would not – that's not going to help you. Listen, I don't know what Michael Jordan's sleep cycles are like, but I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this much, Christian. Do you see how much Michael Jordan cares about winning and losing? Yeah. Do you see that? Yes. He is not going to go up and jack, himself, jack his body up to gamble. He obviously, you know, probably – he's probably a night. I'll probably say he's up to like – 2, 2 a.m., sleeps till 10 p.m. He could do that kind of stuff. So him being at the casino till 2.30, whatever. He probably went went to sleep, got his eight hours, got up, went to New York City, and then balled out. I, I think it's, it's, it's unquestionable that his lifestyle impacted his play. 
And maybe how many titles would he have won then if he had a better lifestyle? Who knows? Maybe he wouldn't have felt so tired and and wanted to retire at after ten years in the league. He wanted to retire. I know there are other things going on, but this guy, this guy was was doing 18, 36 holes of golf before playing games. That the same I don't day. Know, what, a, what what a savage. Yeah, but that that has a toll. He's a person. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't. It not, absolutely not does. It you. absolutely does. If you are just going burning your candle on both ends for years and years and years on end, that has a price. There's a price. Period. Mm. You can't. You, uh, Lee, help me out. There's a price paid. I'm. I'm not helping you out here because I think to equate it to that on why he got burned out is not right. I think it's. Man, can you imagine not being able to walk from your yes. hotel room to the elevator? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like you can't walk or anywhere. Yes. You don't have any freedom every second of your day, unless you are in bed by yourself in your hotel room, you have somebody wanting something from you. That's, and I think that's where that's, all the other stuff comes from. He wanted to get away from basketball. He wanted to get away from all that attention. Sometimes I think that's probably what wore him out more than anything. All the questions all the time. I do think that's part yeah. of it. I, I 100% think the, the pressure cooker of not being able to have anything resembling a normal life was a lot. Obviously, the death of his father had an impact, even though he said to that one guy, I'm going to retire and go play baseball. before." Which, if you don't want the pressure cooker, why would you go to Birmingham, Alabama and play baseball if you don't want media attention? Because that's that's all you're, you're signing up for. But well, I'm sure listen, it was less. Listen, bottom, it was bottom probably line, less, right? They're, oh, Chris is fired up. Let's tr- go. Well, well it's, it's ridiculous to me that you guys don't understand. This is a guy that would drink, smoke cigars, be up all night. That impacts athletic performance. If you guys had athletes that were doing that, you would advise them against it. And Yeah, despite, uh, yeah and, unless and, it was Michael Jordan. <laughs> and in spite of – yeah, perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> there, there, is a, there is a cost there. There is a cost. It does – hurt you and he was so great and maybe it helped maybe it helped him and maybe it helped him on the mental side but it does not help your body if that's what you're doing yeah well here, here's what i'll say i'll say i mean i'll say obviously that there's a cost benefit analysis and when you have someone who is i think in my opinion unquestionably the greatest of all time to say they would have been better i i think you're you're reaching you're grasping you're grasping at straws and so um he was so intensely focused on what he was doing. And I was talking about the anxiety versus performance. Now we're getting the sports psych, but he probably likely needed those things to take his mind off of uh, what, you know, it was trying to focus on, which was probably, he was probably trying, he was probably obsessing in his head about basketball 24 seven. And so being able to play golf or gamble or do those things was taking his mind off of it, which was probably actually really, really beneficial for him. I, I would venture to guess. I agree with that. But I don't see, so, I don't see where smoking and drinking factors in there. Well, I mean, if you want, listen, Christian, he's an adult. Uh, I'm not going to tell another oh, man. What does that have to do with anything? Of course, he's an adult. <laughs> You're going to tell what? What am I tell Michael Jordan? You can't smoke or drink. No like, one should have told him insane. anything. I'm not saying anyone should have said, Michael, you need to stop. I'm not saying that. I'm saying just the choices had a cost, and what you put in your body mm. takes a toll. But Christian, but you're saying there's a cost, but what is the benefit? He's literally the greatest of all time. Like, how much greater do you want him to be? Like, if he didn't take basketball off, he might have won seven. He he would have won seven in a row. Think about that. Well, he actually did come back, and they didn't win. Yeah, but, Mm -hmm. I mean, he was playing baseball for months, right? I know. I know. Yeah, Yeah, but, I mean. Seven in a row. Think about that. Think about that. I I think you think about what – um. I don't. I, I think the the science, the sports science, is different than it was then. And I think now LeBron and these guys, they have all this information, so they do all this crazy stuff to to keep but, their body. Bunch of whims. Like, <laughs> maybe so sav- savages like Michael Jordan. You ever play thirty six holes of golf and drink whiskey and smoke a cigar and then go dunk the ball on people? All right. Or they can play for like another <laughs> ten to fifteen or, more years. Or you cannot retire retire twice in your prime. Yeah, I, that's what he wanted to do, man. You know, the, guy, the guy won six titles. He did indeed. Um, okay, so where where I have a lot of um, let's keep I, going. On this. I learned a you lot. Know who, I learned a lot watching this. I feel like I'm getting painted as anti MJ just because I think maybe he could hater. have not drank and smoked as much. I think it would have helped him. 
I don't think that's he could have been greater. Thing. He could have been great, greater than the hey, goat. Absolutely, um, Christian he could have been better. One thing I want to one thing I want to bring up here is, and I'm like Ben, man. I'm fascinated with the mental side of everything. Probably even more in wrestling than I am the physical side. And if and Winston Churchill talked a lot about it, every body that's achieving at a high level, you develop escape habits and you have to have them. Mm -hmm. It's that separation yeah. from what you're obsessing about. Everybody has those things. And sometimes it develops an unhealthy habit. Most people don't even realize they're developing that escape habit, but you're trying, you're trying to get out of the reality that completely obsesses your mind all the time. So I think that's what the gambling, especially the golf came from Michael Jordan because we can all know he's addicted to competition. Yeah. I mean, you watch that dude Ooh. throw quarters at the wall with his security guards. He's addicted <laughs> to competition. I mean, he is absolutely addicted to it. That's what gets him out of bed every day. That's what gets yeah. his blood pumping. And I think when you do it at that level, think about the moments he was in, the experience he's mm. had. The more you experience those things, the rest of life starts getting pretty dull. It's not like you can just hang out at the house and have a normal life and be okay with it, man. You've just elevated that level of adrenaline that you're at that you're hooked on to such a level that you got to keep spiking it. And I don't, I, I mean, again, you're, you don't know what's going on through Michael's head, but I don't know if he could have been Michael Jordan without those things. And I agree with you. There's going to be a physical toll. You can't deny it. Science is science, right? But I don't know if Michael Jordan's Michael Jordan without those things. He was such an extreme when it came to his mentality that those extreme habits are going to come out in his life. Yeah. I think what's, what's, what fascinates me about, I don't know if I said this on the show or not yesterday, but, I, I, the reason I like wrestling and wrestlers is because it, it's just kind of, they're imbalanced in a lot of ways, especially the greats. And you can just see it and just how they live their lives. And Michael Jordan, Kobe, the, any, any great, I feel like they're, they're imbalanced, imperfect oh, yeah. people as we all are, but they're imbalanced, right? There's just like disproportionate focus and there's sacrifices they're willing to make that, that others aren't. That's always really interesting to me. And Michael Jordan, he sacrificed a lot, right? I in my in my mind to to achieve that. He he sacrificed being liked by many of his teammates and competitors because he knew that was the way he manipulated his teammates and the the mental side that he was playing, that chess game was a, a huge part of his edge. Right. And I think I think that's part of the reason he's he's so fascinating to so many people, including me. Yeah. So one of the things I tweeted last night uh, about this while I was watching, I think, episode six. But, you know, he was sure. What was he mean? Of, yeah, of course. Right. He had a high expectation of his teammates. But I come off the dock feeling like that they might not like you know, go get coffee all the time, but they have like a deep love for Michael. You know, they, they really like him, although they, they realize the abrasive side of his personality. And I think that's a really one. I was actually talking to uh, Josh Otto was working at my house on Monday and, you know, we were having a discussion about this and it's like, I think a lot of wrestling coaches go to the two abrasive side and they make kids quit. Um, and Michael Jordan just, he just had this intuitive feel for not going too far. And, um, and, and, pushing the teammates where they need to be pushed to obviously achieve as high they, highly as they could as a team. And so, you know, I think that's fascinating to watch kind of as you go through, because I think you could think of other great athletes who on their own are really good, but then their team under, you know, underachieves significantly. what do you think about, um, I just thought this was fascinating. The, the Rodman dynamic when mm -hmm. he wanted a vacation, I thought that was so that was awesome. And then it's like, okay, Robin tells this guy, and this guy tells Phil, and then Phil tells management. And then the principal's office is Michael Jordan. You got to go to Michael. Damn straight it is. That, that, that to me was, was really just that. Obviously, he's the leader uh, of the team, but like something about Michael having the final say there is so interesting to me. Like, you got to, I'm yeah. the head coach. This guy's the owner. This guy's the GM. You need to ask Michael if you're going to take time off, <laughs> right? That was interesting. Yeah, and it was, was almost awesome. like it was almost like it wasn't just that they they needed him to sign off. It was I don't want to say this. It was like they almost wanted his read too. It's like all right, what what does Michael think about it? What what does he think the right move is here? What's the yeah. it, even though Phil Jackson was the master head game guy, that's like his thing. He knew how the mental but side. But that 
They wanted but to Christian, know- that was part that was part of the mental side is Phil letting Michael be the leader, right? Yes. I mean, that's that's part of it is Phil did was it this overwhelming personality? What, what does he have? 11, 11 NBA rings as yes. a coach. Yes. And I think a big part of that is and this is like, I'm going to go back to some wrestling coaches being overbearing. Like, you don't really think of Kale as overbearing. You think, ah, he's just this guy who sits in the corner and, you know, he lets his guys do whatever they do. And, you know, he's probably a savage sometimes, but not all the time. Like, that's that's what I think of Phil, too. He, you know, he kind of lets things be. When he needs to interject every once in a while, he interjects. But most of the time, he just, like, lets these guys have space and, and be their own bosses. And that's kind of what empowers them to be what they are. Yeah, and it's interesting that you've got on the one side you have Phil Jackson, who basically he did what you described. He was deferential. He only stepped in when necessary. He was kind of like able to zoom out and uh, yeah. manipulate. C- contrast that with Jerry Krause, who was so obsessed with having credit that he blew up a yeah. dynasty that had Michael Jordan because he couldn't get over the fact that he wasn't getting the credit. Phil was able to put yeah. his ego aside. Basically, every other bull had to put their ego aside for for Michael. And and because Jerry couldn't, Jerry Krause couldn't, and because yeah. Jerry Reinsdorf was so – and Jerry Reinsdorf, his problem was he was too deferential. He was too, I'll let the general manager be the general manager, right? He's my general manager. Yeah. I hired him to run the team. He runs the team. And yeah. because he was – and that's the other side of the coin where Jerry Krause, he built this team, but he was out of control, and you had an owner that wouldn't wouldn't step in, right? And he needed to step yeah. in. And because he didn't, they lost Michael Jordan and Phil well, Jackson. Go. Not that I love Jerry Krause, Christian, but I'm, I'm going to push back on that. I push back on the, on the Jordan thing. It's like I, I, would I agree with you that Jerry Krause blew up the dynasty? Yeah, of course, right? Should Jerry Reiner have stepped in? Maybe Jerry Reinsdorf not stepping in was what allowed Jerry Krause to do what he did before that, right? Because maybe if Jerry Reinsdorf had been more overbearing, maybe that would have never got started, right? Maybe he, uh, Jerry Krause would never felt the empowerment to make some of the moves that he did. So, you know, there's always a there's always a push and pull. Anytime you push, there's a pull also, right? You can't just have one side of an equation. So, I, I you know, yeah, did Jerry Krause blow it up? Sure, but maybe that's Jerry Reinsdorf letting him kind of have that much freedom was what allowed it to be so good. Well, uh, I agree with that. But on the other side of the coin, it's like with Phil, okay, let Michael be Michael. Okay, Michael just punched Steve Kerr in the face. All right, you're out. (laughs) You have to intervene when your guy is out of pocket. Okay. Jerry Krause was out of pocket and required intervention and possibly likely termination. And he didn't. Whoa. and for yeah, yeah, you gotta go, bro. You would have fired you him. You're you would have fired him. Yeah, you fire. Well, oh, well, you make it work. Listen, here's. Yeah, I'm stepping in here. Phil Jackson is is the coach. We need him as the coach because we need Michael Jordan. You don't let Michael Jordan leave. He said, "I'll only play for Phil Jackson." Well, there it is. Phil and Michael will continue. Now that becomes <laughs> a conversation down the line because there becomes a, a point where that's diminishing returns and you do have to make sure, yeah. long-term uh-huh. decisions. You don't make that decision when these guys are in their prime. Coach Roper, yeah. any thoughts here? Uh, emotions are a powerful thing. I mean, you mm-hmm. can see Jerry Krause unbelievably driven by significance. He wanted credit and he wasn't getting that credit. And if you go in and re- I've read a, a bunch of stuff on the Bulls and Phil Jackson and Michael Jordan and kind of telling the story of Jerry Krause always wanted to be one of the guys. There was a big pushback with him riding the bus all the time with the team. And Jordan wanted more separation from the team and the front office. And blending those lines are where all the beef got started. And as you've seen, when Jordan wants to get on a guy, he'll get on him pretty hard. And he used to get on Jerry Krause really hard all the time. Mm-hmm. There's even some clips in there. I remember him smoking oh, a cigar. Yeah. And he says, sorry, Jerry, you can't have one. It'll stunt your growth. Yeah. I mean, just ribbing <laughs> a guy like that all the time, uh... right? Yeah. And that's where the beef comes <laughs> in. And man, when emotion gets involved, you can lose sight of this is Michael Jordan. He's the greatest guy that has ever played this game. We have him on this team. He's a part of the organization we built. He's helping me pay my bills. Mm-hmm. You can lose sight of that. It just becomes personal. And I think that's what happens. And man, things become personal. You'll burn something great to the ground. You just lose sight of all that that's obvious to people that are outside of that emotion. If you start to believe your own BS and you start to believe I mean I think Jerry Krause really I think probably deep down he sort of believed he did build it and make it and 
you know, he had the quote about organizations win, not players and yeah. coaches. Uh, I think he really believed he built, he made it right, and that he would. And I believe he thought he would make it again. And you saw a little bit of that with the Kukoc coach dynamic in '92 with the uh, with the Olympics, and they're like, "This is going to be the future of the Chicago Bulls." He was already in '92 thinking about, "All right, how am I going to do this again?" Because I don't want to do it with with Michael because X, Y, and Z. This guy's not really. I'm not getting the the shine when really Kraus was getting probably as much shine as anyone. And he does deserve credit. You're right, Ben. Kraus does deserve credit for for what mm-hmm. he built, but then that doesn't give you autonomy. It gives no no one can have just pure autonomy to do whatever they want to do when they want to do it. Because even with my, even Michael Jordan needed those those boundaries. And Michael, I think that's why he respected Phil is because he just felt like he was installing those boundaries. Where as you, you, people crave structure, you know they 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 crave that. Kids crave that, and yeah. I think. Jordan craved it too and knew what it, how it would help him. Uh, another thing I, th- I thought about a lot was just the, if, if Michael was prodded in any way, you know, it would, it would just end so badly. Magic Johnson in the dream team practice uh, yeah. says, you know, Michael, if you, you don't turn into air Jordan, we're going to blow you out. And then they come back and they, they win, and Magic ends up throwing the ball into the bleachers. And George Carl, just because he didn't say, hey, hey, what's up, Michael, at, at the restaurant, he's like, this dude has got to go. And Clyde Drexler got compared to him into the finals, and that was it. He's like, I'm, gonna ta- I'm, gonna, I'm going to torture this dude. And then, yeah. so I thought about that, and then, you know, th- then I thought about, like, you know, some of the you, you get a little bit of, of feedback in this job, right? And yeah, some of it like just doesn't make sense to me. Like people are people are upset with us or me or something we said or did or wrote. And then I'm reading about how Michael Jordan literally made up that someone said something to him just to create that flame, right? Just like I need a little yeah. something. All right, this guy told me nice game, Mike, after he beat me. He didn't say that. He admitted he didn't say that. But that was what Michael required at that time to give it. So then I'm like, man, well, I'm, I'm sure that he's not the only athlete to experience this. And yeah. so now I kind of view that in a different light. Like guys just fair or not, whether something I said or wrote was, was unfair or not. That's just a way some guys get their edge. Yeah. You know, you know, whose uh, mannerisms uh, as I'm watching Michael Moore mannerisms start reminding me of Michael's. And, and vice versa. And I'm not really sure if this person is going to take this as a compliment or an insult. I, I'm thinking it's going to be compliment, but Jordan Burroughs. Uh, oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. A lot of manners really. And, and Christian, I'm, I'm going to put, I'm going to put him out there a little bit. He can get mad at me, whatever. Christian, he was legit pissed at me for picking Kyle Dick by writing time in a fake tournament. Like you talk about Michael Jordan getting mad about shit. That doesn't matter. Like Jor- Jordan was, you could, you could verify. He was mad at me. We're picking Kyle Dake by riding time in a tournament that, that did not exist, right? I mean, and, and so you you think about, like, the ultra-competitiveness that that takes, and, you know, you think about Michael Jordan doing these things, and it's like, you know, you see the same some, some of the same things in a lot of these athletes. And obviously, you know, Jordan uh, Burroughs, people don't have quite as much access to him like they had access to Michael Jordan, where Michael Jordan was doing interviews every single day. And so – you know, I, I think some of Jordan's inner competitor, Jordan Burroughs' inner competitor, doesn't oh, isn't always shown out necessarily. But he, he is he is a savage competitor that doesn't like losing at anything, and you know does feel those slights. Go ahead, Coach. Yeah, I I agree completely. I thought about that comparison a lot of the times, and it I started thinking that about how many times Jordan Burroughs was down by one or down by two, and he's got to get the takedown in the last second, and he did it. He is one of the best competitors I've ever seen, and and there was a moment during that interview, and I was talking with my wife about it. I was like, oh man, I think he I think Dake just messed up, and it's just my opinion on it. But I saw Jordan Burroughs, his mentality changed. He kind of sat up straight, and it was like. Okay, it's going to be like that. And it was something about when he said about you've lost a step or you've gotten old, that things just changed. <laughs> and it was, it just, his mentality changed. I actually texted Christian about it. It was so fascinating to watch. I was yes. just glued to Jordan's <laughs> face the whole time. And yeah, things changed in says, him. And it was like, says, honey, take this kid. <laughs> you have to get with him. It He's was, like, honey, 
take this. <laughs> and as I'm watching this, as I'm watching the Jordan documentary, it just kept reminding me of that moment, man. You cannot give a competitor like that any extra juice. Yeah. Just well, that got... next gear to find. Yeah. So going back to that competitiveness, I want to ask a question about like why he did those things. Do you, do you think Jordan was just so much better than everybody? And there's a part in there that I was fascinated about from BJ Armstrong talking about when Jordan stopped playing basketball and he was doing something different. And he's like, I don't know what it is. I'm not at that level, but we're playing basketball and he's just trying to win. Do you think he was so much better than everybody? He just got bored. And I asked the question this way. So Ben, in your competitive days, when you're trying to be the best wrestler, yeah. if you just had to wrestle high school wrestlers all the time, and that's all you competed against, would you get bored with it? that you're just so much better to find that next gear that you've got to get yourself something extra to get excited about. Cause basketball is different. There's a team sport. Other yeah. people contribute. Do you think that's part of it? Just, he was so much better. He got bored with it. Well, I think, so I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I did, I would say I did in the college room sometimes. Um, and I would say that's why, that's where goal setting becomes really important. And, you know, I don't know what, you know, how Michael set his goals, but like, my goal my last two years was to win the Hodge. And in order to do that, I had to finish every match before seven minutes. And so that was something that drove me. And so I know like at Missouri, we, we had Saturday matches. Um, and, you know, so we had to pick like five matches and wrestle them, whatever. And so, and so then afterwards we had to write the score on, you know, a little sheet of paper, whatever. And, you know, if I couldn't always get the best guys, right. There was only one max. So I could only wrestle them once or one Raymond Jordan. Right. So, and sometimes you, know, you just weren't able to match up with them for whatever reason. And if I had a JV guy, I wouldn't write the score. I write how many times I pinned him. Like I pinned this dude nine times, you know, I would write the score. I would write fall. I write nine pins, 10 pins, eight pins. Right. Because like, that was my goal was to pin them as, as many, as many times as possible to keep myself mentally in check. And so with Jordan, I think that that was the thing here is like, yeah, he didn't have to be all the way on all the time to compete and or beat some of these guys. And then so when there was that one thing that, like, clicked for him where, okay, I got to go, then, you know, all of a sudden there's just an another level that's there for him. Yeah. Um, no, no question. So I got a tweet pulled up from, from Coach Roper here that reminds that – I didn't remember in the moment, but he said, this is after the Dake Burroughs FRL. Oh, All I can shoot. think about after FRL today is it's dangerous to poke the bear. And, you know, sure enough, this so much of this documentary is about not so much of it is about, but there's so many instances where guys poked, prodded Jordan, the Gary Payton comparison, what Gary Payton said, you know, um, all these little things totally fired him up. And then. You've got Kyle Dake, who is certainly game a game competitor who has beaten Jordan Burroughs. But, man, did he – Coach Roper, did, did did Dake mess up? Man, I, like I said, I think he did, man. I just don't think you give that guy anything extra. And Dake's an incredible competitor too. He's one of mm -hmm. the best guys that will yeah. raise his level. He I is. think we're going to get an incredible match. But, man, you just – I just, you guys have seen the same matches. Burroughs, when he's got to dig down deep and find something, he's just got a way of doing it. And you want to make sure he's got to do that himself. You don't want to give him any extra incentive to go find that. Whatever makes him Jordan Burroughs in his head. Everybody talks about Jordan Burroughs' physical attributes making him stand out. But to me, it's the mentality that he has, how bad he wants to win. And, I mean, you guys have heard him talk about his legacy. Being remembered as the best wrestler is very important to him. Yes. And that's a driver. That's a motivator for him. And to give him something extra to go into, I think it's just not very smart as a competitor. I get what he was doing. Kyle Dake likes those mind games, and he's strong in that. But, man, it's just a it's it's a dangerous game to play with a guy that gets to another level. It's got another gear that's hard to compete with for anybody in the world. Yeah. And so I, just to go off that, I actually think making people upset is generally – beneficial to the other person right I, I, for, for against most people if you can get them shook if you can get them upset generally you can use that to your advantage against them um but there are a few elite competitors where it doesn't work and i would say jordan bros is one of those where you know he seems seems to not a lot of people do but he seems to compete a little bit better when he's angry most people compete worse when they're angry or just when it just seems like when the stakes are a little higher and the intensity raises He's able yeah. to, he is able to raise his level in a, in a in a freaky way, and I, some sometimes some way there's gonna be a way to do this. But how many matches he's he's snatched 
victory from the jaws of defeat, or he's been down late. There's been a lot of matches he's been down late. He's not. He was not just a otherworldly point scorer, right? He had to be, and that's yeah. why there's that's why there's such affinity for Jordan too. Jordan, Michael Jordan, right? Is this guy was not? Yeah, that he was on the best team ever, right? Or you know, probably the best team ever. You could say something about the Warriors, but mm -hmm. you know, seventy-two and ten when the record was 69 wins. And, you know, he was a dominator, but he also had these incredible clutch moments that I think are why he is separated from everyone else in, in basketball lore. It's like your ability to do that. And that's something I've seen with Jordan so many times, and he had he's had two really strange lapses late that just seemed so out of character. But in general, that's been a characteristic of Jordan Burroughs that we haven't really seen. Um, well, I think yeah. when you're taking that many game winning shots like Jordan did, he missed them too, right? Yes, like, he did. Yeah. You just put yourself in that you put yourself in that moment so many times. The odds are against you at some point. So I think Burroughs the same way. You put yourself in those moments, you're not going to get them every single time. And there's not a whole lot of game winning shot moments in wrestling like that. Most of the time, the match is decided in the closing minutes. But how many times Burroughs been able to dig deep? I remember back the first time I saw it was he was wrestling Takatani World Cup, I think it was. It was when he had his streak going early in his career and he hadn't lost yet. Mm. And it was closing down and I was like, oh, well, here's it. Here's Bur Burroughs' first international loss. And just out of nowhere came this next gear and I was like, whoa, man, this guy might be something different that we hadn't seen in a while and come to see he really did really elevate his game. But that was the first time I ever saw him find. So you say he's in fifth gear all the time, jump up to that sixth gear when he had to and be like, no, I'm winning this match. Sorry, yeah, bud, yeah. you're not beating me today. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, okay, I had some some other thoughts, um, but curious for yours. Any anything you know, Pippin? Man, I did not remember that Pippin. I remember the migraine game. I didn't remember he didn't go in for a, a play uh, with a, when they drew a play for for Tony Kukoc. And how about Kukoc making it? That was crazy to me. But what, dude? Pippin, at least in the the way they've made him look in this, other than that moment, that was a. That guy was a dog. He was insanely tough. He was like kind of about that life more than I kind of I re I realized or remembered watching in mm -hmm. real time. Um, well, you got to think he had to have a special mentality to be able to survive with Jordan all those years. Because yeah. I imagine if Jordan was hard on anybody, it probably was the the guy he counted on the most. Mm -hmm. And yeah. man, it take a it take a special mental makeup to be Scottie Pippen. I would love for there to be an in depth like documentary done on Scotty because that's probably just about as rare as Michael Jordan. And man, yeah. I've struggled with significance and ego and things in my life and gotten in a lot better spot about it. And I heard a quote one time that really stuck with me. Everybody wants to be Batman. Nobody wants to be Robin, but everybody forgets if you're Robin, you're still a superhero. Mm -hmm. So man, that really <laughs> yeah. stuck with me and really uh -oh. Uh -oh. ego too. Am I back? I you're back. for a second. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, really helped me we get a hold of my ego. a few words. So, man, I would love to hear – I'd love to hear Scotty talk about that dynamic a whole lot more because, man, Jordan's done and done, and I'm loving the documentary as much as anybody. But I think Scotty Pippen's a special character in it. To be that guy is probably pretty hard to do because in his own right, he's one of the greatest guys to play too. Mm -hmm. And you think about I, – I compare this to coaching maybe, and you talk about – Penn State and what they're doing as a team and Casey Cunningham and Cody Sanderson they they could be head coaches at big programs yeah. in my opinion right I don't I don't even think that's my opinion it's just like a fact right and they're they they know what they're I mean the, they're able to be satisfied and challenged and enjoy where they are being at the highest level and I don't think it's I think there's there's a really high level mentality with with the choices they're making too, right? Because yeah. there's there's just this pool, there's pull, there's an allure about being the guy at your program and the credit, mm -hmm. right? If you're at Penn State, Kale Sanderson is getting the credit, right? Kale Sanderson yeah. is gonna is going to get the lion's share of the credit. Uh, no pun intended there. Even though I think we are very <laughs> typically complimentary of. Cody and and Casey and what they've done and they've been there since the Iowa State days and that that is just a unit that is really really strong and I think that shows uh shows maybe one Kale's pull 
and Kale's yes. ability to be unifying in that way. But two, it's like they, they are pretty – they are – their egos are very much in check and in line in the right way too. That's that's how I see it. Because everyone wants to be a number one. Everyone's looking. Guys have great. I I, I see. I, I talk to a lot of coaches and they're they're in really good situations. It would seem like to me, but they're just they just want to have their thing. They want it to be their program and their vision and their. And I don't know if that's all ego, but I do think that's as part of the wrestling mentality is like. I want to be in control of my destiny as completely mm-hmm. as possible, right? I'm a wrestler. I'm in control of my thing as as much as I possibly can be. If I'm the number two or the number three, even if it's at an awesome program, I just would kind of rather be in charge of my own thing, even if it's not as good. Yeah. Uh, man, there's a lot to unpack in what you said there, Christian. So uh, I'm going to try to do it all. Um, I, I think there – I think that wrestling – especially like you said with individuality in basketball, how many guys are the star of every single team they play on or other team sports, right? I mean, you, uh, by the time they go from high school to college to, you know, some uh, club teams, they probably had to play a role at some point in time. Whereas a wrestler, he's always his own person, right? He's always an, an individual. And so, yeah, I think, I think there is that strong allure of running your own program, doing your own thing. And I think uh, to your point, it comes at the detriment of a lot of wrestlers. Mm-hmm. A lot of wrestlers um, could be better, would would be a lot better off if they figured out how to work better with others, to work in a team environment a little bit better as a coaching staff. And some people have figured that out. And you know, the one you brought up is Cody and Casey and Kale and that whole Penn State dynamic. It's fantastic. It's probably one of the best things that Kale does is get everyone to stick around and get everyone to be a unified team. He doesn't really have to my knowledge, any dissenters, right? Anyone within the program who's kind of like, you know, not unifying. And, you know, I think that's probably a lot. Uh, a lot of it is Casey and Cody being great in that, in that role. But then all, a lot of it is probably also Kale does something to make them feel highly valued. To say, guys, I really appreciate what you're doing. It means a lot to me. You're, you know, you were helping out. So, th- so they view it that way. So, you know, it's kind of, I believe, on both sides, not just on, the case and Cody are not just on the kale, but it's, it's everyone working together as a unit. Yeah. Coach? Yeah, I'm thinking about, as Ben was talking, thinking about some of my own experiences too and how Doug validates what we do. He's 100% right. I mean, you get a call every now and then about other jobs and see if you're interested. And, I mean, I'm not. And why am I not interested in doing my own thing is because I feel like such a valuable part of what Doug's building here. And some of that's on me to know my place and my role and what I'm good at. But part of that's on him to make me feel empowered and important in my role, too. So, Ben, I think you hit it out, knocked it out of the park there. It's just that symbiosis of relationships that makes special things work. It's never going to be one guy. Like we talk about the Bulls a whole lot, too. And Phil Jackson, go guys, go Google text winner after this. Go look up that guy oh, yeah. who was a pretty who was a staple in Phil Jackson the whole time. Everybody knows Phil Jackson for the most part. Not very many guys know Tex Winter. So, man, there's always going to be people behind the scenes, and there always will be. And somebody has to be that guy. And for me right now, that's the role I'm enjoying. And because I feel valued in it. I feel validated in it. And that's the trick, man. Yeah. That's good stuff. Bracky, give it, get, spit some takes, dude. It's just <laughs> been fun to watch for me um, – because I was a kid most of the time Mike was growing up so a lot of this stuff in its early career I don't really remember so it's cool to see all that um, all the footage and of course I've seen the game winners and all that stuff but it's cool to see all the behind the scenes stuff and I I didn't know like about Jerry Krause and all that stuff so it's cool to learn just all about that and I mean I'm not gonna lie uh, I'm a team LeBron guy for the best player of all time. Oh, boo. I said best player of all time, but uh, I mean, there's no denying how great Michael Jordan was. What I find interesting is um, Michael, for what a savage he was, a, a lot of players, he had pretty, I'll say, decent relationships with some of the opposition either. You think about Magic or whatever. He had to kill him first, I think, probably <laughs> before yeah. that would happen, right? But, you know, I think about the Dream Team and, and they were able to do it except for Isaiah Thomas and what he did. And they're like – and and you know what? Jordan does kind of get uh-huh. blamed for uh, Isaiah not being on the team. And it's, it's probably partially unfair, but it's also partially 
true, even though he didn't orchestrate it, everyone knows, don't even don't even try it. Why would you mess up this chemistry where this guy got in fights with Pippin and Magic and Bird and everyone hates him and he'll jack the whole thing up, which really it kind of points to the importance of, especially in a team sport, chemistry. And that, mm-hmm. you know what, you can add an all-time great talent who Michael Jordan said, this is the second greatest point guard of all, all time, but he would not work on this team, right? And it wouldn't have, wouldn't have made sense to have him. And I thought that was, that was a really interesting part. And something I didn't – I only learned about this Isaiah Thomas, Michael Jordan thing. I was listening to Bill Simmons, and he was talking about it just like a couple years ago. And I, I hadn't realized that dynamic before. And um, I don't know, it says something about the importance of chemistry in team sports that they would keep Isaiah off. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> that was a great point, Christian. I agree. And you almost, do you feel a little bit bad for Isaiah Thomas or you don't feel bad at all? I, I don't know. I kind of go <laughs> back and forth, man. He was the, – there, there was – I just think he, he, he crossed the line, right? Go ahead, Coach. Yeah. That's part of who Isaiah Thomas was as a competitor. That's what made him so great. He got under your skin. Mm-hmm. He was that – man, he was that guy that just needled you and needled you and needled you till you lost it mentally a little bit. So that was part of his edge, and I think part of his edge in games came back to bite him in a moment. I mean, some of the things that make you great at what you do, there's a bad side to it as well. I mean, just simply thinking about how hard Michael was on some teammates that couldn't take it, there's probably some guys out there that play with Michael that really don't like him. And probably what they don't realize, it was never really personal from them. You saw them get emotional when they read all those things with talking about Michael being a tyrant. They just, he was misunderstood. So I think that's what came and happened with Isaiah Thomas. It just backfired on him a little bit, his edge in, in games. I, I'm curious. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that, po- that point, Coach. Uh, the end of Episode 7, Jordan, Jordan breaks down emotions. They're talking about him as a, um, as a teammate. And, you know, were you a jerk, this and that and the other. And he – so my, my wife and I are watching it together, and it ends, and she's like – well, I, I had a different interpretation. She, her interpretation is probably what is actually true, but I looked at it differently. She thought – she's like, wow, he was really that upset that he was thought of as a bad teammate. And when I watched it, I was like when, – when he's kind of being asked about it, he's explaining it like – He's almost, I want to say, a little flippant about it. This is, just, this is just the price. This is just the price you pay mm-hmm. to get to where you want to go. And I thought he was revisiting some deep-seated competitive emotions that he probably hadn't tapped into in years. And this, the, the, the questioning was bringing it out of him. And he was thinking about th- the steps you take to be great. And, and I thought he just misses it. And he missed tapping into that, and that just overcame him emotionally. I don't, I don't think he got overwhelmed defending himself for the teammate he was. I think he was somehow re-tapping into that competitive spirit that was that is still. You can play golf all you want; it's dormant in in in, in a different <laughs> way than it than it was when he's trying to chase down basketball championships. But I'm curious what you thought about that, guys. Yeah, I took a little I, different I, take, Christian. Yeah, Ron was. And I I like the point. I never really thought about it from that aspect. So I'm going to think about that a little bit. But I think it came from he was just misunderstood. And you go back to even his emotion when he lost his dad. It's almost like Michael Jordan wanted a peer. He wanted somebody to be at the level he was. So I think going back in and saying he tapped into some of those emotions was right. But for me, it was more that he was misunderstood, that not very many guys got what he was doing, to understood that we're going to go to a level nobody's really – been at before as a team and I'm going to push you guys to get there like I remember him talking with uh, Wellington one time who they had a really good relationship because I think Bill understood Mm -hmm. and it was like you could take it a certain way he's like hey man jump on Superman's cape this ride's going to be wild and Bill's like yeah let's go man I'm never going to get to this level without you I'm on I'm on board so I do think he tapped into some motions but I think for me it was more being misunderstood than that competitive edge but I'm going to think about that a little bit I like that thought yeah, rewatch yeah. it. I'm curious what you guys think. What do you think, Ben? I, I, I'm, I'm having a tough time just thinking about <laughs> thinking about what I think, um, and I'll just give you kind of all, all the different angles. And you know, I think I think 
a lot of it was, you know, he, he knew he needed to push those guys, and right, that was a price he was willing to pay to achieve what he did. Um, and I think part of it maybe is he didn't have a recognition of how he came off. And I'll, and I'll just tell you for myself, uh, my, my wife is, my wife points out to me sometimes, like, there's been times where I think, oh, hey, you know, that was great. We were all, everyone got along. And she'd be like, Ben, you're being an asshole. And I'd be like, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about right now. And she's like, like, and now the longer I've been with her, it's like, I sometimes I don't, I'm just so intense and I just go and I don't have a recognition of how I come off to other people. And, yeah. you know, she makes me see that. And I think Michael probably felt the same way. And obviously there was so much positive that came with positive being the all the success and championships and money that came with him being the way he was that he maybe didn't have a recognition of how it came off to other people but then at the same time there is the balance if if he would have softened would he have had the success that he did and you know you got to kind of pick one side or, or the other i think it's kind of it's tough to have everything yeah i i think it's an easy trap to fall into um the, the mentality that he was at, I, I know just for me and the, the thing that I'm doing, it's like I have a hard time with people not on my team, right? Like people – it's just like if you're on the other side or whatever, it, 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 that's maybe a weird way to look at things. But I, I just have a hard time um, being even even cordial, right? It's just something mm. in me. That that is all, that I need to reconcile probably, but it's just part of my makeup in some ways that I'm just not good. Like you're either with me or against me, and I can't imagine the level that gets to when you're Michael Jordan and when you're trying to do the things he's trying to do. So in yeah. in a lot of ways, I couldn't relate to Michael Jordan, and I really can't. But I can kind of see how it can get to that point where. Man, you're you're punching teammates. You're, you're kind of, out of it's like you're so you're so on the line all, all the time. It's like like Coach Brands when he's talking about you know we like to take it over the line a little bit. It's like you know you're if you're always at the line, you will cross the line, right? And yeah, I think that some some people just don't even want to approach the line. And then with that, I think. I think that can limit your success. If, you, if you're never opening it up, if you're never using the car the way it's supposed to be a car, if you're not testing the car, you're not getting the most out of it. And if you're not approaching that line with some regularity, you're, you're, you're probably selling yourself and your team short a little bit, right? And I think that's probably the, a conclusion he reached. I don't know when he reached that conclusion. And I think the evolution of Jordan is what is also interesting because while he was great at UNC and, and very good for the Bulls early on, there was a, there was an evolution, and that's something I'm I'm curious yeah. if you guys have like the timeline and the and the when did it when did it flip when do you think it changed? Coach Roper, you talked about B.J. Armstrong's quote, but when did he get to that point where um, he became that savage? Right. Yeah, I go. I I bet I watched that clip. I was watching it with my wife. She got mad at me. She's like, "What are you doing?" I was like, "I'm fascinated with this." I bet I watched it ten times. <laughs> just that thirty that thirty second. I thought it was just. Man, and, I, and it's something I've been thinking about a little bit about when guys just elevate themselves and they almost start playing a different game. And it's kind of what I was talking with Ben about yesterday. He made me realize there's just levels above what people normally do sometimes. And I think that's what B.J. Armstrong was illustrating, that Michael Jordan, yes, he was playing the same game everybody else was, and then he mastered it to a certain level that he just started seeing things differently. And I think that was part of his genius on knowing when to push and knowing when to give credit, knowing when to ask a guy to step up and take a shot. I just think he looked at things differently because of how much he poured in to trying to master the sport and not just master the sport he was playing, but win. To be the best all the time, 24-7, I think he just started looking at a basketball game differently than most people did. It would, man, that clip of B.J. Armstrong so far has been my favorite part of the whole documentary. I think there's some great insight to a level people get to. And man, I, I just... I wrote it down in my journal that night. I can't wait until I get to be a part of a wrestler that starts to look at wrestling different that way. It's going to be a fun ride, and I think I'm going to learn a whole lot about the mental side of sport when I get to observe it on a very personal level. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, uh, I would – go ahead, Ben. One, one guy I want to say that I, I think I observed that I observed that this year, um, and I, you guys might call me crazy. I'm not, I'm not sure. 
Uh, but I think Spencer, Spencer, Spencer Lee went there this year. Um, I, I think the past years you've seen, I don't know if it's this hesitancy or this, you know, kind of worrying about what other people think of him or how he looks or how he appears. And I think he had another level to go to. And I think, I think, I mean, you guys would all agree that this year he was at a different level than he was at previous years. And I, I think that's a, a mental flip. And, and I still think, in my opinion, he's got a little bit of a way to go to just think like to get on. If you could have put Jordan Burrow's mind in Spencer Lee, mm. I don't know if Spencer Lee's ever, ever going to lose, right? E- ever, ever. And um, I think he got closer to that this year. And I think that, you know, if he can keep going, he and that's kind of, I think, like you said, the evolution of Jordan. And I never really thought of it that way, Christian. That was a great point to make that he definitely evolved mm-hmm. as a leader, as a basketball player, as he got older. Yeah, uh, the, the Spencer Lee thing is interesting. And when you think about, you know, when did Jordan Burroughs find that? Yeah. He, he had to find it too, right? And not just in his wrestling mm-hmm. ability. He, he, he changed, his mind changed, right? Very, very obviously. Yeah. And around 2011, his fifth year senior season, and we're talking about a true junior with Spencer Lee. So oh. he, he still oh, wait, got Hold play- on. I, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Keep going. I'm an idiot. Sometimes I do this really bad thing where I cut people off. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, Christian. Does Amy have to tell you that, hey, you're interrupting oh, people? Yes, all the time. All the time. Our poor yeah. wives, right? Jeez. <laughs> you got okay, Lee Roper wait, so- watching BJ Armstrong quote 67 times. Ben's interrupting everyone. I'm just the worst in general. Um, Bracky's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think Jordan was the- Jordan Burroughs was there as a freshman in college. I remember watching him, and I know he did not have a lot of success, but – he killed my buddy Josh Wagner. I remember. I, so I remember. I remember very vividly. He comes out of red shirt. Okay, uh, Josh is supposed to pin this schmuck, and he gets freaking drilled in the first round of the Big Twelves. And I'm like, what on God's green earth is happening? And I remember. I don't think I watched Jordan's first round match, but I, I remember the match versus Matt Storniola, who was the number two seed at the NCAs, and they went to double overtime, and he lost. And I, I remember thinking, holy shit, this kid, this kid's special, you mm-hmm. know. And then watching him grow. But so in order to grow at the rate he grew at, his mind already had to be at this place where he was he was gonna do whatever it took to get better. Because if you think about if you think about what it took from going as to uh what a sixteen and thirteen freshman to the next year being fourth in the country, I mean those are two those are w- worlds apart, right? Mm-hmm. And so somewhere so was it third? I'm sorry. That's a, that's yeah, fine. some somewhere the third or fourth. Yeah. Either way. So to go from one place to the next place, his mind already had to be that I'm I'm going to go there, right? Mm-hmm. And then the next year, obviously, wins the NCAA title. Um, so I, you know, I don't know when Jordan's mind changed, but I, I think it was definitely earlier than his freshman year of college and uh, maybe senior year in high school. I, I I had no recollection of who he was or what he was doing at that point in time. So I don't know. One thing that's interesting. Um, so I I feel like. Jordan, while he had incredible ego and self belief and stuff, he did he he possessed just the right amount of humility. Where he's talking about coming into his rookie season, he's like, you know, I I knew, I yeah. my goal was to go after the best player and just outplay them. He's like, that would be my voice because at that point I didn't have a voice. So he wasn't a big. He became a big talker. He became like one of the most notorious trash talkers in NBA history. But he started out just knowing, I've got I – mean, let me check my ego. I'm just going to literally let my playing do the talking in these early days, even to prove myself to my teammates first and then prove myself to the league second, right? And that was his like, okay, this is the order. So even at a – he had a very mature mind and, and a good process about him even at that point in time. So that, that to yeah. me, I think shows real maturity. Obviously, he had something special in him at, at UNC and before. But it's just, I don't know, the, the evolution is just really, really interesting to me. Because even, you can tell with the media, he was he was different. He was almost, I don't want to say shy, but he was reserved in, to where yeah. what he became. Like, it's not, this, this wasn't a, a, you know, a, a remorseless savage all along. He, he got to that point, right? Yeah. No, I think that's. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a. Go ahead, Ben. Go, uh, go ahead, Lee. I I think you're hitting on a great point, and and Ben, you really got me thinking about. And I won't go too deep into it. I promise. Like my philosophy on reaching greatness, man. 
you got to have the, the mental discipline or mental strength, whatever you want to call it, the mental components, being able to see yourself accomplish or be that great. Mm-hmm. And then you've got to have the physical discipline to get your body to do your vision. And uh, I mean, just the whole time you're talking, I think about some conversations I've had with Luhan. He's had the physical ability to be the best for a long time, but what he struggled with was a vision of seeing himself being the best. Mm -hmm. And he really made a big jump this year with that. So I think you talking about Jordan's vision of himself as a player is a big key point, man. And and really, as I go back and watch this again, I think I'm going to focus on that. How did he view himself and how did that change from his UNC days to where he became be like Mike. He's on everything. He's slinging Big Macs and Gatorade and everything under the sun. How did his <laughs> view of himself change over that time? How much do you, with thinking about Luhan, how much did watching Drew Foster win impact that mind, that mind flip mm. in him? Oh, big time. Big. Yeah. T- like I said, the thing he struggled with was being able to see himself being the best. Cause I've wrestled a lot of really good guys and I wrestled him and everybody on the staff's the same way. Be like, buddy, you're there. Like you're mm-hmm. that good, but for whatever reason, yep. that doubts in your head and it's different for different guys. He just had trouble seeing himself and that vision started to become way more clear this year. And that's why the consistency in his performance started to go up. There's just, man, that's the key component of what we're trying to get to as coaches. And for the most part, the hardest part for guys, especially wrestlers is to see themselves being the best. They put in the physical work. We work mm-hmm. on that all the time, but that vision that I am the man, it's a tough one to get to for some guys. I think it, I think there's a perfect storm situation with with certain athletes. I think I think Michael Jordan's a perfect storm where he had some unbelievable natural ability, call it whatever the heck he want. There were some things his body could do that most bodies can't do. But then to to get it to that that transcendent level, it was his mind. I think John Smith, he that guy's body could do it, the the flexibility and some of the things but his mind is what got him to six in a row. And I think similarly with, with a Dake, and certainly Burroughs is a perfect storm wrestler too. So there, there is just that mental side is such – that is what, that is what I um, attribute the most to Jordan is, is his mind, right? Is That is the special thing. And that is the thing that Michael Jordan has given so much credit to for having as well. Hey, can I, I can't Christian. wait for your guys' discussion on talent. I can't wait just to gas it up again. Christian, I can't wait. Christian. I, kinda got, I got a little, a little something. Christian. Just a little. Christian! Yo. Christian, was Michael Jordan talented when he got cut from the JV team? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> of course. <laughs> well, th- that is so such an interesting thing. I just like, what, <sighs> what happened that that happened, right? Um, so crazy. He wasn't talented, obviously. Well, how how can he be not how can he be not talented? Um, if talent doesn't exist, he can't be not talented. I, I'm, I know, I'm 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 messing with you. I know. I can't wait for. He it. was not he was not talented when he was 16, and then he was talented when he was 18. Who knows what happened? Then. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, no, that I don't. Find you know, one thing we're glancing over a little bit. We've talked about his mentality so much, but his ability to back it up. And I'll tell another story about Jordan Burroughs real quick. It's kind of been a comparison between those two. It's funny. It's Jordan and Jordan. We had guys go out to the OTC, and when they came back, just asking about their experience, one of the guys had never been around Jordan Burroughs before. And he's like, man, I was just so impressed that at that time he was undisputed, best guy in the world. There was no argument. He was the best wrestler in the world. And he was like, he asked more questions. He did every workout. He was at every conditioning workout when most guys were just like, nah, I'm out, man. I'm not doing that. He was willing to put his work ethic behind the belief and the talk that I'm the best. And Kristen, you said perfect storm. And that's what got me thinking down that line that when you got an athlete that believes he's the best and he's willing to work like he's not, that's pretty special. And I think that's what you get out of those two guys. Yes, completely agreed. Um, I mean, this is fun. Um, yeah. How about basketball. Brad Key? Brad Key's just being silent over there, but he's he's fighting everyone on Twitter. Yeah, who are you <laughs> so yelling at? Who oh, you yelling? Well, no, after I said the LeBron thing, everyone tried to come at me. And you can think Michael Jordan's better. That's totally fine. <laughs> I have no problem with that. Um, because I this is where like I would give the edge to Jordan is his mindset. He just has like that killer mindset like you guys have been talking about. Um, while LeBron can take over games, it's just – very few people have that mindset, um, but they're Recky, just... would you agree with this that that Michael that Michael Jordan's a better winner? LeBron James is a better basketball player. 
Yeah, I can probably I get on board with that. Cuz that that's always been my thing is like when you watch them play basketball, LeBron is just a he's better overall player. Um and, and I think the the stats backed it up, but like all anyone in the Facebook comments wanted to do was just scream 6 and 0 in the finals. Um and just like say stuff about LeBron that's not true. So then I was just dunking on those guys. <laughs> <laughs> Got to do it. Some, do. Something Paul's something Paul says a lot. I think LeBron has more ways to win than Michael did, but Michael was better at his ways of winning. Yeah. Yeah. I th- I think there's something to be said for that. I'm I'm you know who got more out of their teammates is is an interesting question because on the one hand Michael I think probably did on the other hand the cast of characters LeBron has had is probably not other than the Miami years not comparable also too like if you and I I know people were bringing this up um when episodes were airing this Sunday like play, players wouldn't wouldn't stay on a I really don't think players these days would stay on a team where someone was treating them like that today. They, yeah. Like well, they I don't would... think for Brecky, that's, that's the balance. Like, I think he was kind of an a-hole, but they also kind of, like, secretly loved him. I, just, I don't think it's the same anymore, Ben. Like, I really don't. These, guy, these, guys, these guys are cool with just going off and being on their own team because they're getting more money and they're the guy. Like, I mean, Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook and James Harden were on the same team once. And yep. now they, they all went their separate ways, and they want to be the guys. Now, Durant went to Golden State, though. Yeah, he, he did. joined. He joined, he, like, the greatest team ever. Yeah, he, he ring chased. He just wanted to get the ring. Um, but that, that's who Golden State had to call to stop LeBron. That, that's who they had to call. They said we, Dr- Draymond Green called him in the parking lot after they just lost at home, game seven, after going 73-9, and nine, being up 3-1 in the finals. And losing to LeBron said, "Hey man, we need you, need you." We've had Bracky well, and I have I'll, had this LeBron conversation so many times. <laughs> I'll back you up on the fact, Bracky, that like LeBron can play point guard, Michael Jordan can't. LeBron can play center, Michael Jordan definitely can't. Yeah. So as far as being a better basketball player and being well rounded, and part of that's just his size too. Right. Man, I'll He's I'll give bigger. you that LeBron's probably a probably a better basketball player. I'll give yeah. you that. I think I think I see your point on that one. Hey Christian, yo. Uh, well, when you when you initially brought up the last dance last Thursday, mm-hmm. you were bringing it up in reference to Kale Sanderson, but yeah, Kale Sanderson has not really come up in this discussion. Yeah, what exactly were you talking about at that point in time? And let's bring it up now. So, my, my thought was, guys that hung it up clearly in the throes of their absolute prime, right? With where. What what Jordan could have done if he had not retired the first time or the second time, we're probably looking at eight, eight maybe nine titles. Who knows? Because who knows yeah, how much fair. how much attrition. And and one thing that I'm fascinated by is he retires the second time. He comes back with the Wizards, and just how much that time away. It's because. I think if he just stayed on, the level he would have been at the Wizards years, I think would have been higher had he just not left the game. So who knows how much he left on the table, right? And so I guess my question is the Kale-Jordan thing, and there's maybe no comparisons, right, of why Kale Sanderson, as great as he was, decided, I just don't want to compete anymore. I want to go and do this. And even he came back, right? He came back the one time in 2011. And Mm -hmm. so what, what is it about... Is it the pressure of greatness? Is it the pressure of having to replicate? Is it one thing I thought of? He knows Kale and Michael know what they have to do to do that thing again, and it's just it, it's just such a maybe staring down that task can be really daunting, yeah. right? Like yeah. I know how to do it, I know how to win it, but what it, what what it takes out of me, I just don't know if I want to go there, right? Yeah, well, I don't know if I want to go there again. I don't know if that's what they think. I don't know what why the reasons are, but it just fascinates yeah. me. Well, let, let me speak. I can speak on Kale for sure because I, you know, I was at the 2004 Olympic trials. I was actually in the same bracket as Kale. Um, and you know, it's funny because we brought up earlier how Lee said that the media attention for Jordan and how they were on him every single game was one of the things that made him quit. And you know, Kale obviously at that point in time, and Flo didn't exist, so the amount of media was 
uh, probably minuscule compared to, you know, we're talking probably like 1% or 2% of what Michael Jordan was getting. But I can tell you that I had the feeling from looking at Kale that he didn't want to be there. At 2004 Olympic trials, he, he didn't want to be in the building. He just couldn't handle the pressure from, you know, there's that pressure. This is Kale. He's the first undefeated college wrestler ever, and he's our American savior, and he's going to go win an Olympic gold medal. And he didn't want, Kale didn't want that pressure for whatever reason. I don't know why. And I remember watching him at the 04 Olympic trials, and he lost to Lee Fullhart in the second match. And I'm not trying to offend people this morning, but shit, it happens. Lee Fullhart wasn't on the same damn planet as Kale Sanderson. He wasn't. I'm sorry. I wrestled both of them. They, they weren't close close to the same ballpark. And so for Kale Sanderson to lose a match to Lee Fullhart was unfathomable. And Kale didn't want to be there. And so I, I know later I heard from other people that Bobby Douglas had to literally talk Kale Sanderson to going to wrestle the third match of that series. Like, Kale wanted to leave the building. Like, And I heard this after the fact, that he did not want to be there. And so there was something about that media pressure and that pressure of Kale going to win the Olympic gold medal that Kale didn't like. And if he somehow could have reconciled that, yeah, I, I think Kale would have stayed on to be, you know, I, I think he could have won a whole, bunny, a whole bunch more world titles. And, you know, uh, you saw a little bit, I, if, if, it, if Kale could have just been Kale the wrestler without everything, just, just let me... A carpenter can go be a carpenter, a blacksmith, a, a mechanic. Can I just go and wrestle and, and the things around it? And I think you saw a little bit of that with Jordan on, in a couple of different ways. One, the, the media pressure was, was absolutely insane, right? But two, insane. even even going back to, man, I got to make political statements. I can't just be a basketball yeah. player. I've got to I've got to come out for a party or or there's a there's a racial component that I'm not whatever. Why can't I? Why do I have to do that? Because I'm yeah. the best at basketball. Fair question, Michael. I don't know why that 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 is has anything to do with you other than you're famous. Which and it, he rightly asked the question. What does that have to do with my perspective on 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 you know race or oh, yeah. Yeah. or politics, etc. So one that I, I think there's a there's a little comparison there, but um, I, I'm wondering what it was was for those guys, right? That that leads guys to kind of leave their best years behind and say, you know what, I don't I don't want to. This is not what I want to do. Yeah, I I like what yeah. Ben was talking about with the media pressure and and man, you made me remember a memory I forgot about Ben, and and I've uh -huh. heard some of the similar things about about Kale as well about how he didn't like the media pressure at all. And it goes back to somebody misquoted him one time. And ever since then, he just hadn't had a whole lot to do with it. But after, if really? you go back and watch, yeah, after, and I, I can't remember was. where I heard that or where I read it. It might've been in one of the documentaries on Kale, but it was something early in his career that he was misquoted on. And he's like, you just know what? I just better if I don't say a whole lot. But after his fourth title, when he was getting interviewed, and I, man, I, I forgot about this for a while. Go back and watch his interview because the, the lady, I'm pretty sure it was a lady was asking him, okay, what's next? What's next? And she was talking about wrestling. Like, what are you going to do? What do you want to accomplish? And you can almost see Kale get tired and it's like, man, I just want to go fishing. It wasn't anything mm. to do with wrestling or what his goals were. Interesting. Like, I just want to escape all this. So yes. I think really, I think there's something there, Ben. And, and it definitely was with Jordan too because – Magic Johnson even talked about it in one of the interviews. He's like, man, it, it was talking to a reporter. If you guys keep on with Michael like you are, you're going to run him out of this sport early. And yeah. prophetically, it did. Twice. Twice. So, twice. Uh, That's really interesting about Kale. Kale. Christian, we should figure out whoever whoever that reporter is that Miss Coulter and beat his ass. Yeah. <laughs> Can I say what that? The heck? <laughs> Can I say that on there? We'll leave that to you, Mr. <laughs> MMA. That's – yeah. That's probably where you got a plan came from. It wasn't even it wasn't even you, Piles. It's just all the way back then with those reporters misquoting him. Yeah, that's the beauty of videos. There's no misquoting. Here's everything there you go. about it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, as um, yeah, he's certainly not not into the media thing, which which I I mean I understand it um, to a yeah. degree. Yeah, um, but then so then to Christian to your point about I mean we're. 16 we're 18 years off of kale's college career we're 16 years off of kale's um olympic gold medal and jason no i mean i think this is where you brought up. jason nope was on instagram saying that uh you know kale could still beat everyone in the room a room that includes olympic champion jake barner olympic champion kyle snyder world champion david taylor all at really similar weights to what kale is at and that's like 
that's almost mind blowing. Yes, yes, it is. It it is mind blowing. I mean, he's a he's a wrestling super genius, right? And you know, I I rewatched his his uh. The, you talk about imbalance, right? In, in, just the imbalanced lives, the imbalanced perspectives. You know, I'm watching mm-hmm. Kale after 2011 World Championships, and this is just the look of a completely devastated man when he, because the standard is just so high that he holds for himself. Clearly, it's it's yeah. in it's in him, right? That he has this crazy standard, and you know, not getting, not winning worlds. You know, he's like, you know, he's like qualified the weight. He's like. I mean, you know, I got fifth. He's like, basically said that was, that's pathetic though. Fifth is pathetic. Fifth in the world is pathetic. Even though you've been retired for seven years, even though you yeah. schooled Jake Varner in the height of his powers, you schooled him and you schooled everyone, Kale, because you lost to Sharif off and you lost to, the, I think the Russian, because that happened, you, you, you are not satisfied. There's just like, there's a lack of, Kale would give his own athlete, I bet, so much better perspective in that moment for getting fit yeah. <laughs> than he would even have for himself. Kale's yep. – and, and part of it is just in the moment, right? He's in the moment and he's emotional. But the other part of it is like just in, in him there is just something so different, right, that you just don't have a balanced view of athletic performance and life in, in the scheme of things because it's just so – it's so important to him. It's so important to him that he would – and Michael would and others would rather not have it than to have it and not achieve, right? That's yeah. how I look at yeah. it. I don't know if that's the case because Michael came back as a wizard and um, he was not quite as magical. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, think, I, think, I think the Kale-Jordan comparisons are, are fascinating. And what's interesting with Kale is that he has been able to do, in a way, what Michael hasn't, which is have – the next stage of his career have incredible success. Whereas Michael has been a struggling GM in the NBA for a while. And he's had his hands in a lot of different teams and they haven't, they haven't performed. And Kale has built the, the gold standard for college athletics, not just like wrestling yeah. college athletics at Penn state. Well, I mean, they're, they're not exactly the same position, right? Cause Kale, of course not. Know, and, and obviously from, from, what we've heard, I mean, we talked about Cody and Casey earlier, but, you know, Kale's really hands-on in the room a lot, doing a lot of wrestling stuff, and, you know, Michael's a GM, right, which is not nearly the same thing, so it would be really interesting to see what, uh, you know, what Michael would be like as a coach, and you wonder if he would be able to relate to athletes, um, because if he's not, you know, to to what we said about earlier, he was kind of a dick to a lot of his uh, Bulls teammates, but he was also willing to grind it out with them, right? Mm-hmm. And now as a, as a GM who's 53 years old or whatever he is, he's not going to be able to get in, in there and grind it out with, with the athletes. So are, is he going to be able to have the same effect uh, with them? Well, one other thing, you know, it's something that Bracky kind of mentioned up is like, can you do this now? Could you run a guy? Up and you think about Kwame Brown yeah. for the Wizards. He broke that guy. That, that guy was, that was a broken man. Now, was Kwame, was he ever going to be mentally tough enough to endure the rigor of NBA basketball? Was he ever going to find that drive within himself to reach the, the level that he could? Maybe not. Maybe it would have never happened. He's a, he's a what if. But this is the number one overall draft pick. The, the, it's pretty rare for a number one overall to do absolutely nothing. Now, the Cleveland Cavaliers managed to draft one that was out of the league in several years, and Anthony Bennett, not that long ago. But in general, it's very rare that you get nothing out of a number one overall pick. And Kwame Brown was in the league for a while, but was never anything resembling elite. And if you're going to say, you're going to take the good side with Michael and say he got this much out of his peers, but he could cross the line, you have to also acknowledge he might have crossed, crossed the line with Kwame Brown and broke him. This is a guy right yeah. out of high school. He needed to be he needed to be taught everything, right? He was yeah. he was very probably emotionally immature as many 18, 19 year olds. This is not you coming out of three years with Dean Smith at UNC, Michael. This is a guy coming straight out yeah. of high school. And I think he broke that guy. And I think that that also needs to be part of the that's the other side of the sword with Michael that can't be discounted. Yeah. Yeah, and I think you've got to go into the fact that and again, go in and do some reading on Phil Jackson's role. He would prepare these guys for Michael too. 
So there's a dynamic there uh. that it's not always going to be one guy. So you didn't have Phil Jackson preparing these guys for Michael to hammer on them and building them back up after Michael hammered, hammered, hammered on them. Didn't have Phil Jackson there to go, whoa, Mike, you don't understand. These guys aren't you. Back it up a little bit. So it's never yeah. just going to be one guy. There's going to be a, a relationship of a bunch of people that make something work. So I think if you don't have that perfect storm of where Michael was and the people he had around him, he might have been too much of that hammer and just broke guys down. So when you lose what happens behind the scenes, it might just become too much. Yeah, yeah. And those Good guardrails point. that he had with Phil did not exist when he was in Washington, right? And at that point, maybe yeah. you think he, he didn't even – Michael didn't recognize how he still needed them and put the things in place. And you know what? <laughs> On the other side of that coin is like how – well, how many guys – can Michael Jordan genuinely respect their perspective when his standard is so high? How many guys could he say, yeah, you can come in and do this and I'll listen to you. You can't just say yeah. the coach is the coach when you're, when you're Michael Jordan. So it's fascinating, yeah. but it is, it, it is interesting to me. And you know what? Say, yeah, I know Michael is not a coach. He is a GM, but he has chosen his profession, right? He has chosen and he's done it to, to be good at it. And he's to this point, hasn't been. And Kale has, and that's, it's just interesting to me. Um, Stephen Christian. A. Smith should get some credit for breaking Kwame Brown, too. <laughs> yeah, because Stephen <laughs> A. Smith, Kwame Brown. <laughs> he, he was relentless. Slava Medvedenko. Uh, yeah. Oh, Stephen my gosh. A. Christian, you Yo. remember when we do the, the state duels today? <laughs> yeah, that's that. <laughs> well, there ain't no state duels. Duel got, duel got uh, postponed. That's okay. I hope uh, it's okay. Oh, hope, man. We, we are not going to get to it. This was worth it, man. I, I really <laughs> – Kendall Cross, Kendall Cross was having trouble getting down to 125. We had to push Yeah, him back he needs another day. We got to have trouble making weight. Uh, That's fine. Oh That's my fine. goodness. Um, <laughs> it's going to take us like three weeks to do these duels at this pace. That's okay. <laughs> well, listen, that, that's great news. That's the best news you could have given me, Ben. Um, oh, so man, I think we, we go to some questions for a little bit, and then we only have nine minutes to go, and then it, then it's go time, uh, unless we have any. Yes. Um, Oh, a, a coach just or someone just texted me. Kale gets to recruit. Uh -oh. MJ does not. Big difference. Maybe, maybe partially point. true. Partially true, but um, there, there's an element of recruiting. Ke Kevin Durant was sure enough recruited, right? He was he was convinced. The the Miami dynasty or you call it dynasty when they yep. won two. That was with Dwayne and Bosh and. LeBron, that was recruited. Maybe the GMs don't have that power, but at the same time, Pat Riley kind of made that happen. So I think that that is a difference, but there, there is a it, there there is some similarity too. One small thing, I he's think, not the I GM. think what you got to – Oh, he's not? He's an owner. Oh, I thought he used – was he never a GM? He might have been like he was for a while. basketball op, like president or something like that, but yeah. Okay, so maybe I think what you got to get into a little bit is the different types of leaderships too. So like when you're an athlete and you're a leader, you can be an alpha. I mean, just as much as you can have a dominant presence. And I think most of the time when a coach has that as their leadership strategy, it's too much. It's too overbearing. You have to have that little bit more passive servant leadership which if you look at the personalities between Kale and Michael, they're very obvious, right? One's very outspoken, very gregarious, and one's way more reserved. So I think one leadership style is more served to mm -hmm. leading other people when you're outside of the competitive floor. So I would say that, that yeah, Kale probably has a personality that fits to be more of a coach than Michael Jordan ever would just from the other parts of their personality other than the competitiveness because I don't think there's any – Denying Kale's one of the most competitive guys out there all the time, wants to win at everything. And I think that's the similarity. But as far as, man, I have to be the front runner, the alpha, the guy in the front all the time, I think that's where they have a lot of differences. So I think Jordan would probably struggle being a coach just from that standpoint. Yeah, very, very possibly. Um, yeah, so Jordan took full control over the basketball side of the operation with the title managing member of basketball operations, whatever the heck that means. Mm. Um. Okay, we'll get to like a question, <laughs> maybe. I I gotta uh, ask this question. I with what? with Leon. What? Christian, the Facebook. Brad, are you looking at this Facebook chat? Michael uh, Novak. Oh my God. He says if Kale is Jordan, does that make Joe Heskin Scottie Pippen? And obviously, Sion is the security guard with the crazy hair. 
<laughs> oh man. Sion wanted to come on today. He's like, he, he he wants to come on next week. I don't know if we're ready. I don't know uh, if we can do Sion uh, again. Um, which international wrestler has had the greatest impact on wrestling technique? Asks um, oh, Pops Redfoot. I'm curious. Uh, for, that's a tough for, question. Yeah, I know. That's why you guys are here because I don't freaking know. Uh, you go first, Lee. <laughs> um, maybe Fed Zayev for me. You just saw so much. He really made uh, inside step a lot more prominent back when he was wrestling. Everything was outside step before that. But man, you could go, you could go down so many different rabbit holes with this. The guy that had, but but for me, with what I saw, Fed Zayev really had a big impact on what he was doing in the way he attacked his neutral game. Um, that's just the first name that came to mind. But, man, I'd have to really do some thinking yeah. about that one. That's a big question. Yeah. So but, I feel the same way. Sorry, Christian, go ahead. I was going to say, you, you think about someone as great as Buvisar, Saitiev, but, like, have we seen anyone even, like, closely replicate or try to even emulate that? He had a very unique style. I think similarly about John yeah. Smith. Like, um, as great as he is and was, how many guys have we been able to see even get close to a, a, a facsimile of that, right? Like, I, haven't, I haven't seen much like it. Yeah, I, I agree. So the guy I thought about, and again, this is, as Roper said, this is like first guy that came to my, my mind, although I would withhold for further judgment if I could think more deeply. But uh, Batirov, I, I know I picked up a handful of things from him. He was a, he was a flipping wizard. And so I, I, I know that's one guy right off the top of my head that I'm like, oh, well, I do this and this and this because I watched Mavlet Batirov do this. That's Is that your favorite guy, Roper? I feel like you uh, you love Batirov. I've done a lot of study on that guy, man. His overhook swim where he, would, he was in overhook and come back, swim mm. back into the guy. I tried to do that for years and failed until I finally got the, the feel of it. He was just one of my favorite guys to watch. He was a guy I felt like when yeah. he turned it on, he'd score on anybody about any time he wanted to. And the whole, I'm, I'm, I'm have to, add, I'm gonna have to back up. I'm gonna try to drill this a little bit. But the uh, other thing that he did that is now in folk style wrestling is, you know, when he, when the guy had the single leg up in the air, mm -hmm. he would. Uh, sorry, that's my, that's my bad seal hip. Off. I can't lift my own leg up. So I had, yeah, he would turn and he would, he would seal here, and then boom, he would come back to here and he would fight the hands. And this seal, like, man, that is, uh, that is everywhere in college wrestling now. It really is. Ceiling here, if they come over the top, you go out this way. Otherwise, you can go back that way. I mean, there, there's a lot to it, right? But that that position with the seal out is everywhere in college wrestling today. And from, from what it's worth, I think it came from Mavlo Batirov, who's not even a folk style wrestler. Booyah. I remember seeing – Dake was one of the first guys I've, I've consciously observed do that in his early, early years. And I was like, whoa, that makes a lot of sense. And people were like, that – it's incredible. So he, he got it from Batirov. I didn't realize that. Um, I said, Haji Aliyev does it all the time for a guy that wrestles right now. He's so good at it. Are we yeah. – um, do, do you think that Russians are the most um, uh, impactful in terms of wrestling trends for, of, of any country? We know they're, they're the best. Do you think they dictate the trends the most or mo most on the cutting edge of the new thing? Uh, well, Again, I, thinking I off the top I, of my head, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree because they've had the most success. But the other thing that um, I would say is, is new to America in the last, I don't know, eight is five, eight years, somewhere there, is that, you know, there was there was the Gable mentality. And I and I, I love Gable, but and I don't want to be – this is this is like Christian calling Mark Schultz and Bannock JV. Uh, Which never happened. I, that <laughs> have, it never happened. Well, uh, uh, I feel like Gable might have held back the technological advancement of American wrestling for a little bit because it was just like there was this mentality, we're going to wear them out. We're going to wear them out, and that's how we're going to win. We're not going to get better at technique. We're going to wear them out. And too many people had that stuck in their head, and now I think, you know, over the course of the last handful of years, we've had a whole bunch of guys who, you know, realized that we need to make a technical evolution, mm -hmm. and that's how we're going to win also. We can't just – we can wear – you know, like David Taylor – Sometimes we can wear people out also, but we're not going to just wear people out. We're going to beat them on technique as well. You know, I'll refer to a blog I read from one Ben Askren at one point, and it was about Gable, and it was about this very topic of, t of conditioning or whatever. And 
it, you basically concluded it was like they weren't necessarily more conditioned. They just he had them believe they were so much mm, more conditioned. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And because of that, they were. So how much more they were? They were probably doing more, you know, maybe. But maybe not yeah. much more, not to the degree of guys are just falling over. And so on the one hand, yeah. you have the belief of, of Tom, Terry, Brands, Royce, Alger, all these guys that they can just go for seven, eight, nine, ten minutes and they will not get tired. But then you have the contrasting belief of the opposing wrestler who has it in their mind believing that they are going to be in better shape. And that was in the back of their minds yeah. forever, too. And I think that is like a powerful weapon that, that Gable wielded against his opponents as well. I don't know what Coach Roper thinks about that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of psychological things that goes into it. And, and I've gotten a really good insight just being around Doug every day and to him, hearing him talk about some of the advantages of wrestling at Iowa back then when there really was some tradition. He's like, man, you, you saw the look in guys' eyes. They almost knew that they weren't going to hold up before the match started. So the guy thinking about getting tired so much before the match even started is going to make the guy more tired in the match. And then obviously – I mean, I got to hear some mm -hmm. of their training stories, too. And he was there at the beginning when Gable was there. That was his first year. Just some of the stuff they did. Man, they pushed themselves to the physical limit quite often. Quite, quite yeah, but, often. <laughs> yeah. But then, then Christian, think about the guy. Uh, you know, we got, I know we're over time, so I'll try to make this concise. Think about the guy we talked about a lot today, Jordan Burroughs. So now if you think if you're, if you're winning with one point and you're against Jordan Burroughs, somewhere in the back of your head, if it's not in the forefront, you're thinking – shit when this guy's down by one in the last 30 seconds he's really really good oh my gosh and it causes you to freeze up a little bit maybe then you would be against someone else so it kind of fulfills its own prophecy that he's going to go score in the last 30 that he's done it before and it gets in your head that he's going to do it again mm -hmm. and then it takes another special mind like Zarbek Sidikov to say I am different I don't this does the rules don't apply yes. to me right yes well, and absolutely. maybe that was maybe that was developed almost like it was almost like fake it till you make it with him and he just had to convince himself even before it was true that it was true and then it yes. became true unfortunately for the red white and blue but all will be made right at 74 kilograms one way or the other whether it's steak or burrows i believe in the usa coming up but i believe it's time to go also holy cow we had all these topics we were going to get into and it ended up just being michael jordan <laughs> And honestly, I do not care. That was as fun as I've had. Uh, I really appreciate you guys um, indulging me. Uh, and I'm glad you guys are Jordan fans as well because this was a lot of fun to talk about. Appreciate you guys. Hope that was enough wrestling talk. We tried to interlace enough Kale, enough Jordan Burroughs, enough Kyle Dakin there to, to whet your wrestling appetites. But I think it's all applicable because mindset is huge in wrestling. We'll be back tomorrow. We'll have a plan, and then the plans can change. That happens. Uh, you gotta be, gotta have a little flexibility. All right, that's what that's what helps make it all work. Appreciate you guys tuning in. Four hundred ninety-five strong. We'll be back Thursday. Have a good Wednesday, y'all. See you next time.